From the KPFK studios in Southern California, it's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up, you've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman, and the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. This show is jam-packed today, so we're going to get right to it. In the second half of the show, we're going to be talking to MIT professor Dr. Nicholas Ashford, who is in Greece and has written a lot about globalization and sustainability in industrial economies. Professor Ashford is going to give us his perspective on what is going on over there and what it means for Europe and the world. But before we get to that, David, I'm very excited to hear from our first guest, who I've had the pleasure of actually meeting and have read a number of his books. So, David, tell us about our first guest. Thanks, Steve. Our first guest is Chris Hedges. His new book is Wages of Rebellion, The Moral Imperative of Revolt. Chris Hedges has spent nearly two decades as a foreign correspondent in Central America, the Middle East, Africa and the Balkans, pretty much anywhere there was trouble. He has written, besides Wages of Rebellion, The Moral Imperative of Revolt, he's written 12 other books, including the New York Times bestseller, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, which he co-authored with the cartoonist Joe Sacco. Some of his other books include Death of the Liberal Class, Empire of Illusion, I Don't Believe in Atheists, and the best-selling American Fascists, The Christian Right and the War on America, his book, Wars of Force That Gives Us Meaning, was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award for nonfiction. Mr. Hedges was also a part of a team of reporters at the New York Times, awarded a Pulitzer Prize in 2002 for the paper's coverage of global terrorism. You can find his weekly column on Truth Dig. We are very pleased to have him on the show. Welcome, Chris Hedges. Thank you. Yes, welcome, Chris. Your new book is creating quite a stir, Wages of Rebellion. It was co-reviewed on page one of the New York Times book review with Charles Murray's new book called By the People, a Libertarian Conservative Approach to Many of the Problems in the U.S. Today. But what struck me about your book is how deeply rooted you have it in the ideas of historical philosophers and especially people like Thomas Paine. Most people think of Thomas Paine, if they know him, as the author of the widely circulated revolutionary pamphlet, Common Sense. But after he came to the U.S. or then to the colonies from England, he retained his skepticism over the post-revolutionary conditions in the U.S. Why don't you explain to our listeners why you felt he has had such a, a major role in uh, progressive revolt in America. Because we don't have a tradition of producing great revolutionaries the way Europe does with figures like Bakunin or Rosa Luxemburg or Kropotkin or others. But Paine is a revolutionary. When he came to the colonies, he was 37. So most of his intellectual formation was in Britain where he had been an anti-monarchist. And it was his role to explain to colonial leadership, Franklin, Jefferson, and others, the nature of monarchical and imperial power. Because up until then, the people who would become the founding fathers of the country hoped for an accommodation with Britain, and Paine understood that this was impossible. He also was very vocal about the contradictions within the American system, in particular slavery. He said, how can you call for liberty when you enslave millions of African Americans? He was very outspoken about the subjugation and genocide that was carried out against Native Americans. He was very hostile to systems of religion, which institutional systems of religion, which worked as forms of social and political control, and that made him a very uncomfortable ally. And I think the only reason he really was an ally in the revolution, and I think I just want to say that I also look at the American Revolution not as a revolution, but as a colonial war, a war against uh, the imperial power of its day, Britain, which sent, of course, Prussian mercenaries to march up and down New England and rape and burn and pillage, and the largest armada, I think, formed at the time off the coast of New York, which shelled, besieged, and ravaged the city. He was the only person in Pennsylvania to stand up on the side of the 
insurrectionists, the, the landed aristocracy in Pennsylvania remained loyal to the crown. So there was always an uneasy relationship. He appealed to the yeoman farmer. He wrote in their language that great message. This is the times the tri men souls Washington had read out to his troops at Valley Forge. But once the British were overthrown and expelled, Payne became, like a lot of great rebels, an uncomfortable presence because he held fast to these moral imperatives. He actually leaves to fight Pitt in Great Britain. He's expelled. He goes to revolutionary France. He denounces the call for the execution of Louis the 16th, the regicide, the reign of terror. He himself is imprisoned in the Luxembourg prison, slated for execution. It was just an administrative error. They marked the doors with chalk. His door was open when they went in the morning to get the doors that the prisoners to be executed, all of whom's doors were marked with chalk. His door had been closed and they passed him over by mistake. He comes back to the United States, a largely forgotten figure, reviled in the press because of his attacks on institutional religion. And when he dies, six people go to his funeral. And I think that his story is important because when you hold fast to those moral imperatives, then whatever alliances, temporary alliances you may make with power at the time, the fact that you won't sell out people means that ultimately you are probably, if you remain a rebel, going to become a pariah. And I think, Ralph, you've experienced some of that yourself for exactly the same reason. You know, what's interesting about Thomas Paine, he's so relevant today, Chris, is I would call him a revolutionary empiricist. Like, he wasn't overwhelmed by the American Revolution because he knew what was chronicled in this great book, The First American Revolution by Ray Raphael that even during the revolution, the merchants were hoarding it over the farmers. They were shifting the tax burden to the farmers. After the revolution, the farmers who did most of the fighting came back and they were really badly treated by the merchant class in New England and Virginia and elsewhere. And these were supposed to be the liberators and the heroes. You had Shays Rebellion out of Massachusetts, which was a very fundamental commentary, shall we say, on the resurgence of the domestic oligarchy and plutocracy in the U.S. Let's move to the present time. I mean, you wrote this book because you wanted to ask what it takes to be a rebel in modern times. And you go back to a lot of the antecedents of modern rebellions. That's what I like about your book. It has causal context, ideas count, philosophies of public power, and its maldistribution count. Today, who would you advise a young person today who really is fed up, huge student loans, unemployment, globalization taking away his or her future, the varieties of mistreatment of Wall Street of this young generation of Americans that they've robbed of any kind of possible even material emulation with their parents' middle class status. What would you advise these people, especially after the Occupy Wall Street and its encampments around the country was terminated in 2011? Well, that's who I wrote the book for. And if there are two fundamental or maybe three fundamental messages of the book, the first is that with unfettered, unregulated capitalism, what's been done to the poor in this country, where they are in essence, being forced to pay for their own subjugation. We see that in St. Louis County, where 30 to 40 percent of municipal budgets come from ridiculous fines and fees imposed on the most vulnerable. So that there's nothing left now to protect the underclass, the working poor, increasingly the middle class. We are seeing this writ large in Greece. The poor and the working poor in this country are experiencing what the Greeks experience because it's the same system of global capitalism. And this is not about rational economics or rational government. What's happening in Greece, like what's happening in the United States, is class warfare. It is a political reconfiguration to create a rapacious, unchecked, obscenely wealthy, all-powerful oligarchic elite and strip the citizenry of not only the right to protect themselves, but ultimately even the right to earn a wage that has dignity and any kind of independence from the system itself. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that when you rebel, as the Greeks are attempting to do, these forces will become very 
vicious. And we will see in Greece, I expect, what we saw in 1973 in Chile under Salvador Allende, who also challenged international finance, the international banking and financial system, and the political elites that work on their behalf created bread lines and fuel shortages and power outages and chaos, in essence, in order to bring the Allende government down. They will do the same thing in Greece. We have seen the greasification of the poor and the working class. There's certainly an assault underway on the middle class. Should the world's financial system collapse again, which I think at some point is inevitable, I'm not an economist, but certainly many sober economists feel that because Wall Street has gone back to doing what they did before 2008, that's coming, then you will see the same kind of harsh measures imposed writ large throughout the United States. And that's one of the reasons why I did so many interviews in prisons, figures like Jeremy Hammond, Bamiyo Abu Jamal, I was with Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in London, and that's why the book is called Wages of Rebellion. You have to understand the cost, that when you actually rise up, these forces have very frightening mechanisms of control, not only in terms of financial and political control, but ultimately in terms of coercion. You see it on the streets of American cities where an estimated two citizens a day, most of them unarmed, are being shot and killed by militarized police. They will use everything at their disposal, and it will be ugly, and it will be hard, and it will be difficult. And I guess the third major point of the book is that there is a moral imperative to rising up against these forces outside of the certainty of success. Okay, now describe this resistance in two ways. One, what's going on now that you think is constructive resistance uh, around the country, even in localities, if not nationally visible? And what strategy, what specific strategy? Because you're pretty much a advocate of nonviolent civil disobedience, open civil disobedience. So what do you think is going on today that's heartening? And what strategies would you recommend so that the level of resistance becomes more impactful? Well, I'm for nonviolence because revolutions are fundamentally nonviolent. And that's why I wanted to characterize the American Revolution as a colonial overthrow, where violence is often effective, as it was in Algeria and other colonial struggles to overthrow a dominant oppressor that comes from the outside. But revolutions, the Russian Revolution, the Iranian Revolution, the revolutions in Eastern Europe are about appealing to the centers of power. They are internal conflicts, even the French Revolution, and as the great theorists of revolution, Crane, Brinton, and Jeffrey Davies pointed out, who I quote in my book, no revolution has succeeded until significant portions of the internal security apparatus has either defected to the side of the revolutionaries or refused to defend a discredited power elite. That was true in Iran under the Shah, under Somoza, anywhere else. You're talking about the police and the armed yeah. forces refusing and, uh, yeah. to defend the entrenched regime. Sure. I mean, the Iranian armed forces were arguably the fifth largest in the world, completely equipped with the most modern weapon systems capable and, you know, available at the time. And of course, they laid down their guns once the Shah fled and pledged their loyalty to Ayatollah Omini. And that was true. That's how revolutions work. So nonviolence, not only because I know the poison of violence is a war correspondent, but also because that's the only mechanism that will make successful revolt possible. And what we see now, we are seeing the brush fires of revolt, whether it's Black Lives Matter, whether it's the movement to raise the minimum wage to 15, which you are a very early proponent of, whether it is the anti-fracking movement. There are a series of movements, many of which I think were spawned or certainly influenced by the Occupy movement, which don't receive much coverage, but which are very important. And it's always the state that determines the configurations of rebellion, the inability of the state, the corporate state, to impose internal limits, the absence of external limits, means that they will push and push and push, as we have seen in Greece, until there's finally blowback. And if we undergo another meltdown, which unfortunately seems extremely possible, then you will see blowback and you will see the state use everything at its means to protect and defend itself. And at that point, it will probably be pretty naked forms of coercion. Let's take it specific here. We have millions of uh, graduates of universities and colleges burdened by a total of $1.3 trillion in debt. That's even more than credit card debt. 
in Western countries, students don't have college debt, except for recent years in, in England. College universities in Western Europe are like high schools. You know, there is no tuition. And so they graduate without these huge burdens. But in the U.S., you have millions of young people now, the millennial generation, as it's called, in their 20s and early 30s, burdened by this, these monthly payments at horrendous interest rates, whether to companies like Sally May or even to the Department of Education, which makes a profit off student debt. What strategy would you give? There are certain movements here within the student debt phenomena for Jubilee. In other words, you forgive part or more of the debt, and they want to do that by taxing Wall Street stock bond derivative transactions, which are not taxed, unlike our sales tax in stores around the country. So they want to tax Wall Street. This is Senator Elizabeth Warren wants to tax Wall Street and wants to do something about student loans. So you're advising millions of young people. What would you say they should do? Well, I wouldn't wait for elected officials to help you because we've seen with elected officials, they have created all sorts of mechanisms to make sure that you will be burdened with that debt until the day you die. Mm -hmm. uh, even if you declare bankruptcy, student debt is exempt. It just accrues interest. And as you pointed out, interest rates are often higher than if you'd taken the money directly from a bank. These universities and colleges have been jacking up their prices at exorbitant rates. They have been, I think, very dishonest with the student body telling them that taking out these kinds of loans is an investment which will be repaid once they get into the workplace. They are getting into the workplace. They are finding there is no place for them. There are no meaningful jobs. At best, they're working at a subsistence entry-level position, barely able, as you point out, to pay back these incredible sums of money, tens of thousands of dollars. And I would argue that like Black Lives Matter, like the movement to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, there have to begin mass protests. My son, Thomas, who you know, did his graduate work in France, and I said if you told French university students that they had to pay $52,000 a year to go to university, they would shut the country down. And I think that's precisely what has to be done, that students have to mobilize. Unfortunately, while they're in those institutions, the institutions who I hold complicit are not honest because in order to push or seduce students into borrowing that kind of money, they may have to maintain this fictitious line that it's all going to be paid back to them. What we've seen among that dispossessed class of university graduates is the rise of what Bakunin called day class A intellectuals, which Bakunin, I think, correctly pointed out were vital to any revolutionary movement. That's largely the Occupy movement was driven by white sons and daughters of the middle class who got out of college and realized there was no room for them, no place for them in the society, and therefore began to ask the kind of questions they were not asking in college. The problem with the student loans is while the students are in college and university, they don't have to pay. And so they're lulled into this incredible indebtedness. And that's where they can really connect with one another. They have their own campus, their own, own newspapers. So when they get out and they become graduates, they're all scattered. They don't know, have a way to gather. So I know. the question and, is... And they're also, you're right, and it's not just that they're lulled, but these institutions feed them this line that this is an investment that's going to pay off. I was up speaking at Columbia Journalism School a couple of years ago. There are no journalism jobs. Columbia Journalism School, the tuition is $36,000 a year. And I said to friends of mine who are teaching there, I just don't, you know, they said, I said, where are they going to work? And they started saying on the internet, I said, there aren't jobs that pay on the internet. But these schools like Columbia Journalism School are not going to perpetuate themselves unless they become complicit in... They yeah. pushing this propaganda. You know, they got to start street protests, just like in the minimum wage. Right. They know how to, right. The millennials know how to connect with each other. It's not as easy as being on campus where you have auditoriums and bulletin boards and all the rest, but they really can do it. And, and they've got to really get going on this because there are millions of people and they're increasingly getting a larger share of the vote and they would get very good publicity. I read your book, The Death of the Liberal Class, a few years ago, and I just looked at it again, Chris, and I have to accuse you of an understatement. 
I think it's worse than even you pointed out. <laughs> uh, well, and before we get that, questions, that's, from, rare, that's a rare critique of anything I've ever written. <laughs> <laughs> before we get to some questions from David and Steve, because they read your books and they love to ask you some questions, give me the update on the death of the liberal class and how they totally abort any kind of progressive movement in this country deliberately in the form of the captive Democratic Party. Well, it's not. And, and I think that's a point I tried to make in the book. It's not really a liberal class. Figures like Clinton and Obama are not liberal figures. In Europe, the Democratic Party would be a far-right party. It's neoliberalism masking or disguising itself as liberalism. So you have all these self-identified liberals cheerleading George W. Bush's war into Iraq. You have self-identified liberals endorsing a system of neoliberal economics, which is anti-Keynesian. I mean, anti anything that is defined as traditional liberalism. So it's a faux liberalism where they speak in that traditional feel your pain language that liberals have done, but assiduously serve corporate power. And I think you've done as much as anyone to expose that. Now, tell me about your take on Bernie Sanders. I mean, he wants to break up the New York banks. He wants to tax Wall Street transactions. He wants to really regulate drug prices. He's for full Medicare for all, and everybody and nobody out, free choice, a doctor and hospital. He wants to get rid of these corporate tax havens. He's pushing for a $15 minimum wage. He wants stronger labor unions. What's not to like? What's your take on Bernie Sanders getting huge audiences, much bigger than Hillary's at this point, as he pushes his candidacy for president under the Democratic Party. Because he did it within the Democratic establishment. So he's lending credibility to a political party which is completely corporatized and shouldn't have any. He has agreed that he would endorse the candidate, which, you know, unless there's some miracle, will probably be Hillary Clinton. So what he does is he takes all of that energy, he raises all of these legitimate issues, and he funnels it back into a dead political system so that by April it's over. That was the role of Van Jones. Remember, in the last election, running around using the language of Occupy, Occupy the vote, and that's what Bernie has done. I don't understand. He fought the Democratic establishment in Vermont his entire career. Now he's sold out to it. Bernie has also not confronted the military-industrial complex at all. I, on a personal level, having spent seven years in the Middle East, I'm just not willing to forgive him for abandoning the Palestinians and giving a carte blanche to Israel. He was uh, one of the 100 senators, the complete Senate that stood up like APAC wind-up dolls and approved Israel's slaughter last summer, 51-day slaughter of Palestinians in Gaza who have no army, navy, artillery, mechanized units, command and control. So we need independent candidates, and of course that's why I was a strong supporter of your independent runs. That's why I voted for Jill Stein in the last election. But they have to be outside the system, and we have to begin to build movements that are divorced from the Democratic and Republican Party. And my fear is that by this time next year, Bernie Sanders is running around once again repeating this mantra of the least worst and stoking fears against whoever the Republican candidate is. And, you know, it's polit it's we've yeah. gone nowhere. It's, it's we've seen that system. we've seen that routine before. You know, unfortunately, Dennis Kucinich had to toe the line. He was done by April. They even kept him out of some of the debates. And here he is, a loyal Democrat for years, Cleveland and the House of Representatives. Yeah, we've seen that these progressive candidates are done by April. And then they're forced to produce a loyalty oath to whoever wins the nomination. And, of course, it's invariably the corporate Democrats. So, Steve or David, who would you like to discuss with Chris? Yeah, Chris, I have a question. Is that where the energy of the revolution will have to come from, the white middle class? Like the protest against the Vietnam War didn't really heat up until middle class white kids started getting drafted. Is, is that where the, that's going to have to come from? It's an alliance. But... You know, the lower classes, if you look at kind of revolutions throughout history, are very problematic forces. Of course, Karl Marx despised them, the lumpen proletariats. He argued, I think correctly, that they are very susceptible to being recruited by what we would call, you know, conservative, right-wing, proto-fascist groups that are willing to give them a certain amount of empowerment and unleash them against dissidents and revolutionaries. 
I mean, this was a big dispute between Marx and Bakunin, but I think Bakunin's been proven right, that you need that conflation of what Bakunin calls these day class A intellectuals, those people who at one point thought that there was a place for them within the system. And both Davies and Brinton argue that revolutions are not caused by deprivation. They are caused when a large segment of the population, which had expectations about their role and their place in society, suddenly realized that those expectations will never be met. And I think that's why, at least in terms of revolutionary theory, the rise of these day class say intellectuals is so important to building a movement of resistance. And you're because right the, about the Vietnam yeah. War. That's exactly right. Because the uh, deprived poor, they're just trying to get through the day. They don't really have something to lose. They've lost almost everything. Where the middle class, when they're pushed down, they have something to lose, and enough of them can get angry throughout history to rise up and try to make a difference. But I don't think the theory of the lumpen proletariat really applies so much in this country. While we do have some virulent right-wing people who are in the lower economic middle class, I think that the majority of the poor in this country, people making under twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 a year trying to raise a family, can become quite progressive, actually. I mean, they, they poll progressively Hispanics, African Americans, even a lot of poor whites. But it is true that middle class people deprived are less risk averse than poor people just trying to get through the day to feed their families. Another question? David? Yes. You know, we watch the Republicans feeding on each other and the left laughs, and yet the Republicans do very well. What would a liberal feeding frenzy look like in, in the Democratic Party? Why is the left so afraid of a vigorous debate? Well, because the party is completely captive to corporate power. And I think Bernie has cut a kind of Faustian deal with the Democrats. And that's not even speculation, because I did an event with him and Bill McKibben and Naomi Klein and Shama Sawan in New York the night before the climate march. And Shama Sawan, the socialist city councilwoman from Seattle, and I asked him why he wouldn't run as a Democrat. And he said, because I don't want to end up like Nader. He didn't want to end up pushed out of the establishment. He wanted to keep his committee chairmanships. He wanted to keep his Senate seat. And he knew the forms of retribution and punishment that would be visited upon him if he applied his critique to the Democratic establishment, so he won't. The lie of omission is still a lie. And, you know, Bernie's decision to play the game with the Democratic Party and, in essence, lend credibility to the party and lend credibility to Hillary Clinton is very destructive. So a liberal feeding frenzy would see a rise of an actual liberal establishment within the party. I'm not sure one exists anymore that challenged the party for selling out working men and women. You know, but your point is is even further documented by the retribution by the established Democratic Party against their left is pretty harsh, but not against their right. I mean, here's Senator Joe Lieberman. He goes and he endorses McCain at the Republican National Convention against Obama, and he comes back after Obama wins to Washington, and they give him a major chair of a major Senate committee and reinstate him. So anyway, we've been talking with Chris Hedges, the author of the new book, Wages of Rebellion, designed to inform, designed to galvanize you into redefining your role as a civic activist and civic leader. I've always believed that 1% or less of the people of this country, say 3 million people in congressional districts mobilizing for major redirections, can take on the Wall Street type 1% and prevail. Uh, How do people get in touch with you before we conclude, Chris? Give them your contact information. Well, I have an email. That's it. I have no web page or Twitter or anything like that, but it's Hedges Scoop, two S's at AOL.com. And your column appears when? Every Monday on the website Truthdig. Truthdig.com? Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chris. You have raised the ante in terms of what's necessary to change in this country through your many books, articles, speeches in North America. We'll stay in touch. Thank you, Ralph. We've been talking to journalist and author Chris Hedges. His latest book is Wages of Rebellion, The Moral Imperative of Revolt. Look for his weekly column on truthdig.com. You're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Back after this. Stand up. Oh, step up. 
From Pacifica, you're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, www.nader.org. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Remember, if you've missed any of our conversation with Chris Hedges on the radio, go to our new and improved website, ralphnaderradiohour.com, and catch up with us as a podcast. Leave us comments. You can search some of our other episodes. You can also click on a link that will show you how you can purchase a copy of Ralph's latest book, Return to Sender, Unanswered Letters to the President, 2001 to 2015. In his review of Ralph's book, our guest today, Chris Hedges, wrote, quote, Ralph refuses to surrender and doggedly struggles against all odds for a restoration of American democracy and the rule of law. It makes Nader one of the moral and intellectual giants of our age. So go to ralphnaderradiohour.com for all that good stuff. Steve? Thanks, David. Our next guest is Dr. Nicholas Ashford, Professor of Technology and Policy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Dr. Ashford is also a visiting scientist in occupational and environmental health at the Harvard School of Public Health, and he teaches intensive courses in sustainable development and European and international environmental law at Cambridge University in the UK. He is the co-author of Technology, Globalization, and Sustainable Development, Transforming the Industrial State from Yale University Press. We have him on the phone from Greece. Welcome, Dr. Nicholas Ashford. Hello. Yes, welcome, Professor Ashford. He has been to Greece many times. He's fluent in the Greek language. He knows what's going on on the ground. So we've got a real opportunity today to go through the myths that we're reading about in the newspapers here and see what the nature of the Greek economic crisis is all about and what caused it. Before we get into the discussion for the next 20 minutes, Professor Ashford, in yesterday's New York Times, a remarkable article by Eduardo Porter, their economic columnist, who says the Germans are forgetting getting the post-war history lesson on debt relief in the Greek crisis. And the Germans are the heavies here in terms of demanding a crushing austerity on the Greek people. And he writes that in 1953, the debt of Germany coming out of the destruction of World War II, which affected Greece and hurt Greece as well, Germans' debts to its foreign creditors were cut in half. And so here's Germany Decades later, very prosperous, the biggest economy in the European Union is basically telling the Greeks that they have to pay for their past profligacy, and they benefited in 1953, not just extension of terms or reduction of interest rates, cutting the debt of Germany to its foreign creditors in half. So we should keep that in mind. So let me ask you the first question, uh, Professor Ashford, which is, what's the nature of this gigantic Greece debt? Who owes what to whom? And what caused it? Well, I can answer the question. First, let me also go back a little bit further in history, that we uh, basically, through the Marshall Plan, rebuilt Germany at the end of the Second World War. Yes. And we forgave all debts that were due. And by the way, the Greeks never pressed for war reparations, which other countries did from Germany. So there is the question of equal treatment and equal fairness. But let me go to the crux of your question. What caused this problem? The problem begins with the U.S. meltdown in 2008. People don't understand that what we're facing now in Europe today and in Greece is a direct consequence of the 2008 meltdown, which starts with a housing bubble and the loaning by the banks and the mortgage companies to give mortgages to people who they knew could not pay. What used to be said is, well, they're going to privatize the profit and socialize the risk, which translates into, if we lose on it, the taxpayers will make us whole. And if one understands the mortgage crisis in the United States, it is exactly the same parallel with regard to the German and the French banks lending to southern governments, including Greece, but not restricted to Greece, to people who they knew would not be able to pay in order to basically bolster an export-oriented Northern Europe. 
So the same dynamics that have occurred in the present situation are the dynamics that occurred in the mortgage crisis in the U.S. Aside from the analogy, there's another important connection, which is basically the United States Wall Street creative people created the toxic assets, sliced them and diced them, made them into multiple own mortgages and multiple own debts, And these were marketed by the city of London, that's the Wall Street of London, to all the southern European countries. The southern European countries let go of what were double-A bonds by being told that there was a deal that they could get, which were triple-A bonds. And we know now that the rating services in the U.S. were totally off mark. So it is the financial architecture of the United States and London, and then working through the the banks in Germany and France, that basically created this financial crisis. And you'll note, of course, Ralph, and you've said probably many times, we haven't bailed out a single mortgage holder. We've mailed out the banks, but we haven't gotten to anybody whose house is underwater. And Greece's house is underwater. That's basically what it amounts to. And just and to clarify the, what you're saying, in after the Wall Street crash, the reckless lending by countries like Germany and France to Portugal, Spain, and Greece, and other southern, Cyprus. was designed to get these countries to buy products from Germany and other reckless lenders. So you had reckless lending inducing reckless borrowing and now the debt is how much and who is it owned to by Greece? I think the debt is $300 billion is the total debt, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. And we're not talking about million, we're talking about billion. And all of the money that has been loaned to Greece in the last five years has gone virtually to repay, to finance the debt. It's like a teenage kid of yours that gets into trouble with credit card loans and the loans keep building up and you keep borrowing money to pay the interest on the loan, but the loan never gets retired. By the way, not only did the southern countries buy the northern European goods, but they stopped producing those very goods themselves. Greece used to build Toyotas, they used to build refrigerators, but now they buy German cars, have been buying German cars and German refrigerators from Siemens. So it not only caused an enormous spending, but it basically destroyed the industrial capacity of much of the Southern European countries. The IMF and the Central European Bank and the German banks are basically saying to Greece, we have poured money into you every month, which is then recycled to pay us the debt that we seduced you with. And we're not going to do it anymore unless you surrender more austerity. Already, pensions in Greece have been cut by 45%. There's 25% or more unemployment. The GDP has dropped by 25%. There's been a lot of austerities that the Greeks well, there's a lot have of accepted. Who live below the, there are a lot of people who live below the poverty line here. And it is, it's an untenable situation. By the way, I, you could distinguish the IMF from the German and French banks. The IMF has gone on record as saying, unless there is a debt relief, which means a haircut, which means a vitiating of some of the debt, Greece will never, never, not in a million years, be able to pay the debt. And the German banks and the French banks are, are basically ignoring this idea. Now, you know, you, you might want to hear the fact that, well, if it isn't the Greek taxpayer that pays for it, it's going to be the German and French taxpayer. And that is true. But, of course, the German and the French taxpayer have been benefiting from this arrangement for at least since 2010, if not earlier than that. So it's true that the debt will fall upon the citizens of Germany and the citizens of France and maybe Holland. But they have been enjoying enormous increases in the standard of living as a result of basically this export-oriented financial architecture. And Greece does not want to get out of the euro. It certainly doesn't want to get out of Europe. 
And the vote, which was very interesting, I mean, nobody predicted a 60-40 vote, 61-39% vote in favor of this particular government going basically saying no to the creditors because they cannot survive. There are people who voted yes, said, well, maybe we better just buckle up and do it. But it is a financial impossibility. It is not just a question of making it tougher on the Greeks. They cannot do it. It cannot be done. So when you're faced with something that cannot be done, you have to work through a different process. And by the way, the former finance minister, Yanis Varoufakis, runs rings about the German and French and British economists. He is a brilliant economist. He understands the situation uh, because he basically put it in their face. They demanded and they got his removal. They won't do business with him. But the point is that the policy is exactly the same. You want to change the person because you feel better, that's fine. And they feel like they got something out of it. But unless the Europeans cut the haircut, Greece will, not, will run out of money. By the way, which doesn't mean they've quit the euro. All it means is they've got to start printing IOUs. But I also want to remind our audience that we have been printing money since the abandonment of the dollar and the gold standard. I mean, that's what we do. We print money to execute a war in the Middle East. We print money to give to people to, to buy their political favors. The whole world is printing money. And he pretends that we are operating on any kind of an absolute standard. It's just hogwash. I mean, anybody knows finance. Yeah. Professor Ashford, the New York Times lead editorial on July 7th ended yes. this way. Quote, yes, Greek officials past and present are responsible for many of their country's problems, but European leaders have made the crisis worse by their mismanagement. Now it's incumbent on them, namely European leaders, to end the threat to the Eurozone by saving a small paralyzed country, end quote. But how would you answer this provocative letter in the New York Times the same day, July 7th? Let me quote from the letter writer. While I am not in favor of a continuing depression in Greece, the writer says, resulting from excessive austerity, it is the Greeks whom we should blame for the mess they are in. The Greeks submitted false finances to get into the European Union. They then created an unsustainable economic situation by, one, creating laws that until recently permitted retirement at age 55 for many pensioners and paying 96% of their average earnings, two, allowing citizens to fail to report income, pay taxes, or otherwise defraud the government by simply not filing tax returns, and three, accepting a total of 240 billion, with a B, euros in two prior bailouts without resolving its pension and tax problems, end quote. What's your reaction, Professor Nicholas Ashford of MIT? Well, the criticisms of the past Greek governments are legend, and nobody denies them. In fact, if you heard today, and it's very important, Tsipras's talk before the European Parliament... He's the Prime he, Minister. Yeah, he's the Prime Minister. He was very candid of saying that the prior governments are responsible for mismanagement, for not telling the truth, for allowing and tolerating tax avoidance... And he laid it all out. There was a mea culpa on behalf of the government. No one's denying that. However, let me tell you that the rules of the euro were violated by Germany and France themselves. They did not report their own violation of the requirement of the debt to GDP ratio. The reason they didn't go after the southern countries earlier was because it revealed their own mismanagement and their own lying about their own malfeasance. Now, they didn't amount to the same degree of malfeasance as the Greeks did. The Greeks don't have the reserve. But what is the problem is that when you have every dollar loaned to a country not ending up as research and development, not ending up as productivity improvement, you can never get out of the hole that you're in. And that's why the terms have been far too austere. By the way, the austerity question is something we're facing in the United States. The Republicans have basically said we need to cut the budget, we need to 
cut expenses. We need to cut aid to dependent families. And, you know, all under the guise of basically paying back the investors who've got their investments and want their pound of flesh. It's, this is not only a Greek problem, it is a European problem, and it is an American problem. Austerity versus, as Krugman talks about... Paul Krugman of the New York Times. New York Times and Stieglitz and Jeannie Galbraith all say, look, we've got to jump start the economy. Well, there is no way you can jumpstart the Greek economy, the Portuguese economy, the Cypriot economy, the Spanish economy, the Italian economy, because there's nothing is going to improve the productivity and innovation of the country. By the way, you should note there isn't a single known economist who defends the austerity measures. You find politicians defending it, but the three outstanding Nobel Prize winning economists, Krugman, Stieglitz, and Jamie Gilbreth, are to a person absolutely clear about what it is that's going on. And by the way, to its credit, the New York Times, from the beginning, has understood this problem, and its editorials have always been very clear about what it is that's going on. You know, in the United States, people can blame an unwitting mortgage applicant for buying a house he couldn't afford. I mean, you can say, well, you know, he did it because he did it with the encouragement of the bank lenders, the encouragement of a housing bubble that that forced people to buy into the market before they never could. Because they all, the all uh, the big guys, the big banks, the mortgage industry, reckless lending. That's okay if they go under as a housing bubble, millions of homes lost, foreclosed. The U.S. taxpayer will bail them out. This brings me to the next question, Professor Ashford. By the way, but before your question. <laughs> No one's bailed out the mortgage holders. They're sitting underwater. If the housing industry ever let go of the properties they have and are distressed, you would find the collapse of the housing industry. They cannot renegotiate their mortgages because nobody will pay the small amount of money they're willing to give to decrease the mortgage. You know that a family can walk away from their mortgage and buy the house next door for half the money that they mortgage the house for. Too big to jail. This brings me to my last question, Professor Ashford, globalization. People here are saying... Why are my pension stocks going down? Why are my mutual funds going down? Why is the U.S. economy shaking because of Greece? Greece is less than 2% of the economy of the European Economic Union. What's going on here? We feel for the Greek people, but why is it affecting the New York stock market and reducing pensions by many billions of dollars? And I say to them, Welcome to the interdependent Wall Street speculating globalization system, where it basically creates an interdependency that's unhealthy, undermines community economic self-reliance, and any place in the world that gets into trouble raises the specter of the domino effect coming right back down on the United States. Your comment. Well, my comment is, first of all, the Greek situation in no way affected the stock market. It hasn't affected the stock market. It's just too small. But people are losing their wealth. And the reason they're losing their wealth, I think, is is personified by a wonderful book out of MIT by Bryn Yolfson called The Second Machine Age. The problem is we've had so much replacement of labor with technology that there's nobody working with enough of a salary to buy the products of the industrial state. So where do the products of the industrial state end up? They end up as profits, profits reflected in the stock market. I mean, the smart money on northern European and American growth for the next decade is 2 or 3% per year, not the historical 9%. Listen, the party is over. When you replace enough people who are working with machines and energy, those machines and energy cannot buy the product of the industrial state. And globalization, of course, has contributed to that. It's not our money in Greece that's caused the problem. The fact is that our money basically has gone to where labor is cheap, where profit is exploited by having, for example, Chinese women work 12 hours a day, seven days a week. 
and basically, this is the end of the road. We are witnessing the end of the road. A little more squeezing will occur. We have basically killed the goose that laid the golden egg. We basically destroyed our own industrial capacity. Because you can have whatever productivity you want, but if there's nobody to buy the products, what are you going to do with the extra productivity? Professor, the collapse of the Chinese stock market notwithstanding, Apple is finding that more and more Chinese workers are able to buy their iPhone now, which is a big profit center now for Apple. Could an argument be made that they're succeeding in creating a middle class in China and pretty soon they'll be buying American products? Well, I don't know if Apple is responsible for that, but it is certainly true that like Japan, after it competed us with us technologically, they had to turn themselves into a consumer society because they could not sell all the products they could produce. China is on the verge of having to become a consumer-oriented society. I'm not sure they'll buy American goods. <laughs> more, more likely to buy Chinese goods. Well, I mean, if we, but if we opened up, if we actually ever got a trade deal with China, isn't Apple, they've done horrible things. Obviously, they've done horrible things to China. It's, it's disgraceful. But on a macro level, could an argument be made that Apple is benefiting from creating jobs, horrible jobs in China, and creating a market for their product at the same time? Well, yeah, Apple and its stockholders are benefiting. But that doesn't benefit the American taxpayer doesn't benefit the American worker. And, and, and just how far that market will go remains to be seen. I would argue that automobiles are a much more likely source of industrial increases in, in purchasing. In, in well, so is, is the, you say the party's over, but it sounds like if we could construct some good trade deals, we could have a voracious middle class whose values are as rotten as America's uh, in China, and they'll start buying everything. Well, they won't buy things that are made in the United States. They'll buy things that are made in Asia or its client countries. I mean, there's money to be made. Don't misunderstand. Of course, when you start using the energy that is attendant to producing all this technology, what are we going to do about the global climate change problem? I mean, this is a serious first time problem that humankind is facing, and we basically cannot support 10 billion consumers. One last question, Professor Asher. What's it like in the streets of Athens and in the village rural area? Is there panic? Is there increasing malnourishment? Does Greek society have a way to shore each other up? Actually, it's amazingly calm and resolute. Greeks have been through a lot of problems. They've been through the German occupation. They've been through a civil war. The Greeks will always come out, and you're absolutely right. It is this strong family and personal structure that has some people who have the money supporting others so that basically people are not eating garbage out of the streets. People are not rioting, but you have 60% youth unemployed, you have 26% adult unemployed, and that spells disaster for a society ultimately. There's massive depression. There's not, I mean, the anger has given way to real sadness and depression. And you know, that's why the Greeks voted 41 to 39 because they were not willing to accept any more imposed upon them. They don't want to get out of the euro, but if they have to get out of the euro, they would rather go it alone than be subjected to the German and French bankers. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know if the Germans are smart enough to stop this line of thinking that they've been on, because emotionally, I think the Germans, all of the politicians just want to get rid of Greece. And the reason they want to get rid of Greece is because they're afraid the contagion might spread to Spain, which, is, which has got a populist party, which is not very far behind, doing what Syriza, the present government, did in Greece. I mean, I think that there's a serious realignment going on in Europe. They can delay it a few years. They couldn't delay it a decade because the euro is built on a house of cards. Unlike the Fed, 
They can control the interest rate for the nation. You understand that the European Central Bank cannot control the low interest rates that the Germans can lend to other countries and to fuel this export-oriented economy. That's the difference. And Varoufakis, if you read his stuff from five years ago, not his political speeches, has been talking about the ill-conceived euro. It wasn't that having a currency was ill-conceived. It was the banking architecture that was ill-conceived. Everybody knows this. They know it. But they're milking the last piece of blood they can out of the Southern Europeans. Our children will be asking about this time, and I'm really delighted that I'm in Greece to feel it and to see it and to listen to it. Like we asked our parents about the Depression, our children will ask us about this time. That's the kind of historical time it really is. It's not going to pass easily. On that note, Professor Ashford, before we conclude, uh, tell our listeners how they can contact you if they want to. I'm happy to receive email at nashford at mit.edu. You can also look at my website, which is http forward slash forward slash ashford at mit.edu. That's so ashford at mit.edu. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. Yeah. yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Yes, yeah, bye-bye now. We've been speaking on the phone from Greece with Dr. <clears throat> Nicholas Ashford, MIT professor and expert on law, technology, policy, globalization, and sustainable development. You're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. When we come back, we're going to introduce a new feature. Don't go away. From Pacifica, you're listening to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, www.nader.org. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrover. I'm along with David Feldman and Ralph. And Ralph, we're going to introduce a new feature. Tell us about it. Yes, indeed. A leading expert on corporate crime, Russell Mokhyber, the editor of the longstanding Corporate Crime Reporter, has introduced a new feature called Corporate Crime Minute. And we're going to play the Corporate Crime Minute for you listeners, and if you want more Corporate Crime Minutes, all you got to do is go to CorporateCrimeReporter.com. Here we go. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Wednesday, July 8, 2015. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Before becoming Attorney General in 2009, Eric Holder spent eight years as a partner at one of the largest corporate criminal defense law firms in America, Covington and Burling. Now he's returning to Covington. Covington and Burling has represented the two big to fail Wall Street banks, including Bank of America, Citigroup, JP Morgan Chase, and Wells Fargo. As Attorney General, Holder failed to prosecute any of the Wall Street big banks that were responsible for the market collapse in 2008. Dennis Kelleher of Better Markets summed up the problem this way Nothing is more corrosive to the American people's trust in government than the revolving door, where too many officials turn their so called public service into multi-million dollar riches, unimaginable to most Americans. This blatant cashing in is destroying faith in government and government officials. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, that was Russell Mokhyber of the Corporate Crime Reporter. That brings us to the end of our show. On behalf of David Feldman, I'm Steve Scrovan. Join us again for another Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I wanna thank our guests, Chris Hedges and Professor Nicholas Ashford. So long, Ralph, have a good week. Thank you, David. Thank you, Steve. And listeners, get active. Spread the word. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long.